You are listening to South Niagara Conversations, a podcast presented by the South Niagara Chambers of Commerce, along with 105.1 The River and 101.1 More FM. Here are your hosts, Dolores Fabiano and Scott Lunn. We'll get started. Uh, good morning. Thanks to everyone who's joined us for our South Niagara Conversation series. Uh, joining me is my co-host, Scott Lunn. Good morning, Scott. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, Dolores. Thank you. And yourself? I'm doing fantastic. It's it's Friday, and I feel like this was a tough week. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that cocktail this afternoon at some point. <laughs> Twelve oh one this afternoon. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. I um, also want to give a shout out to our tech sponsor Brian LaChapelle from B4 Networks, who always makes us sound so great. Brian, how are you this morning? Fantastic, Saint the Dolores. All right, and you're ready for that cocktail this afternoon as well, I'm sure. Always. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about balancing uh, public health and economic survival during the pandemic. It's uh, coming up on one year, on the one-year anniversary of our first lockdown. Um, and for some people, they've been out of work for all of that time. Our hospitality sector, retail, restaurants have all taken a beating. Our Canada-U.S. borders have been closed for a year, an entire year. And yet, we cannot forget that this is, first and foremost, a worldwide public health crisis, the likes of which we have never seen, and I hope to God we never see again. Does it have to be a trade-off between lost lives or lost livelihoods? What can we be doing right now to protect both? Scott, this is a really deep conversation that, uh, that we need to have. So let's get to it. Who do we have joining us this morning? Absolutely. Dolores, I think this has divided, uh, divided a lot of the country on uh, opinion on this as well. And uh, this morning, we're very pleased to be joined by uh, Stephanie Defoe, who is the COO with the Niagara Falls Bridge Commission. Uh, Jeff Neal, who is a partner with DJB Chartered Accountants. And Asif Kowaja, who is the assistant professor, uh, sorry, assistant professor, faculty of applied health sciences at Brock University. So welcome, uh, all three of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us today. As uh, Dolores alluded to, it's been a year with uh, the bridge shut down. Stephanie, uh, we're in a, an area that has an economy that is based on tourism. Um, can you sort of give us a, an idea how things are sitting with the bridge commission and the, the like, are there any rumors that we, I mean, it just seems so out there and vague at this point. Sure. Yeah, no, um, as some of you may or may not know, we own and operate three of the international crossings that connect the Niagara region to, um, Niagara Falls, New York. And, you know, just from a financial impact perspective, we've had um, the non-essential restrictions have been placed, like you said, for um, o around a year now, uh, meaning only our commercial trade and our essential travel is allowed to cross um, to and from the U.S. You know, the commission immediately saw a drop in traffic. You know, trucks were down about 30 percent, autos down 97 and buses were down 100 percent, which you can imagine the impact on the tourism industry um, when autos and buses, which is their primary source, uh, you know, or a good portion of their revenue comes from that drops 97 and 100 percent. I mean, that's those are big numbers. You know, trucks have slowly recovered, um, but autos and pedestrians um, and bus traffic still hasn't. You know, these ongoing essential restrictions, they they still um, affect us today. We're, we're still down about 90 per, 92 percent for autos and about 100 percent for buses. So it's going to take us um, quite some time to recover. And even just from a social impact perspective, we've seen, you know, the separation of loved ones and the mental health, health issues that go around that. And there's a lot of organizations that are working on that component. And we've seen separation of people from their property. That's been another kind of hot topic at the border. And we see a lot of people, again, working on, on that aspect and trying to make policy changes there. You know, every, every business is so different. You know, some businesses we saw uh, an increase in demand, right, an increase in revenue, um, like the grocery stores. And then for some businesses, it was completely crippling. Uh, the restrictions um, have, have really made them suffer tremendous financial impacts. And then other businesses were hampered by the restrictions, but they were able to pivot and reinvent themselves. The commission, you know, like so many of the other border operators, was kind of a weird dynamic. We had to remain open, provide our tenants and customs with full services, 
um, implement a lot of enhanced protocols for to ensure that the trade and the flow between the two countries could continue, make sure, you know, CBSA and CVP, which are our customs partners, had adequate space to segregate their workforce. But we had to do all of that with significant reduction in toll revenue. So for us, demand increased, but revenue decreased. And so um, it's kind of been a weird dynamic for us. But honestly, the numbers are what stand out the most to me from a, from an impact perspective from the, you know, especially with the being a border city and how much both sides rely on that cross border shopping component, that tourism component, when you see the numbers down 92% for autos still and 100% for buses, you know, there's an impact on those businesses to some extent. And I think honestly, that impact may have existed even if there wasn't restrictions, because I look back to H1N1 and I look back to SARS, all of which I've lived through at the border, our numbers drop, people stopped crossing, right? I think that naturally would have, human behavior naturally would have um, probably changed and crossing patterns would have changed despite the restrictions. But with the imposed restrictions, we saw a, a real drastic difference from those, those past pandemics for sure. So um, I think it was the end of February where they announced some um, testing at land borders. And I know one of yours, uh, the Lewiston Niagara Bridge, uh, was one of the, I don't want to say pilot, but but, but one of the test sites, one we of the, the first ones. How, how has that been? How, how, how has that impacted the travel? Right. Yeah, no, we were actually. Queenston was the first one in Ontario to set up, to uh, have that set up. Um, to be honest, with the restrictions in place, we really haven't seen much of a change at the border other than the actual process of crossing the border. Um, so, you know, you'll be prior to that, if you were an essential worker or tra tra truck travel trade sort of partner, you were crossing without any issues. That's still continuing today. So none of that really changed. It was just the Canadians that are returning back either you know snowbirds returning or or people that are over um, for various reasons that are now coming back into Canada under various exemptions you know now have this added step of having to get the 72 hour um, COVID test in advance and then when you get to the border there's a, a public health and Red Cross station that you stop at get your um, te your first test done and then you get to take a kit with you so you can complete your second test in 10 days. For us it really didn't impact the border tremendously other than it takes up space and, and it does slow the process down but there isn't a lot of traffic so so there really isn't uh, a tremendous impact although we did see a little bit of a uptake in traffic because I think some people um, it may have elected to cross the land border as opposed to flying to avoid some of the other restrictions that are a little bit more cumbersome um, in the air environment. And so we did see a little bit of an improvement in our uh, auto numbers, but it's not significant. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think this pandemic um, has really um, shown us some of the deep defects in public health, not just in Canada, but, but worldwide. As of where, where do we start uh, to make public health better so that our, our population in general is healthier? So that when a crisis like this happens, we're not also um, susceptible, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a very important uh, question right now. Many people are asking um, and no surprise, you know, I teach at university. I interact with people in my community. And there's one common thing that I'm, you know, getting from people here is that you know, people don't really see a bigger picture, right? So for instance, if you ask people, those who are coming here in Niagara for tourism purpose, you know, ask them, why are you here? You know, like a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, we were in a lockdown situation and then people were saying, you know, this is our personal right. You know, we are allowed to go outdoor. You know, this is important. Why don't you just go close the malls? Um, on the other side, if you ask people, you know, in malls, those who work there, this is their living. Uh, they would probably say, you know, we just close the borders, let us work here. And the situation just keeps going on. And if you ask, you know, university students and school students, they would say, you know, shut down everything, open schools and universities. So I think everybody has some sort of a tunnel vision. Uh, people don't think uh, a kind of a big picture. 
this clearly is a unprecedented event, right? So this is more than one person. So we have to think more collectively. Um, again, the question here, you know, um, whether should we have a lockdown or not? Uh, I think it's not a dichotomic choice as, as to whether we have a lockdown or not. I mean, no doubt mandatory lockdown and social uh, distancing measures have proven to help curb the transmission, but we all know that come at a steeper social and economic price, right? And the impoverished and needy people are the hit hardest. And this is a concerning you know, issue for many of us, including people in public health. What really makes people, I think, frustrated here when they see a declining trend of COVID cases on media for momentarily, and then they think, you know, why government is not relaxing the rules? Why are we still in a lockdown situation or a gray zone or a red zone or different zones? One thing I think I would like to highlight here is that daily reported uh, cases may not convey the true state of virus spread. So what we really see on media, sometimes just the tip of iceberg. Take an example, you know, for instance, 1000 people are affected in the community with COVID and the number of tests carried out is only on 300 people. So the maximum number of daily reported cases that we see in media is just 300, which is not a real 1000 cases in community, right? So it is extremely important for us as a public health scholar uh, to understand the situation, the limitations of the testing capacity and trust the system. The other important area, you know, I think Dolores is about uh, herd immunity. I'm sure many of you would have heard the argument from people saying that, you know what, we should be believing in herd immunity. Let the disease spread itself naturally, organically, and we think that strict lockdowns are not necessary. But, you know, I have to highlight the fact here that the threshold for herd immunity for a virus like this is 70%. So we have to wait until 70% of the population get infected organically, you know, to be able to reach the herd immunity, you know, level. But can we afford that? You know, uh, we have vulnerable population in our community. For instance, we have older age people, we have people with chronic health conditions, and they can get infected, you know, very easily if we were to rely on herd immunity. Um, COVID has, let's say, about 10%, uh, you know, a rate of infecting people, those who go to the hospital. So 10% of hospitalization. Can we afford to have 10% of 70% population to go to the hospital? Do we have a system in, in place? So I think these are big questions I and mean, stakes are clearly high here. Um, you know, we also have some um, examples from our neighboring country, you know, where we see that the government has lifted lockdown and people are enjoying their life, which is good. Everybody wants that, we want it. But clearly that has led to short lived economic revival. It's not a long-term economic revival. We see now the resurgence of new cases, you know, uh, new deaths emerging in, in a neighboring country, which is hopefully, you know, uh, going to be controlled soon, but I suspect that might drive us to a second recession. So just to summarize, you know, uh, here, what we are seeing is concerning. And I think we have to think more broadly, a big picture, and do not, uh, you know, just think about the cases which are reported in media or, or just, you know, rely on information about herd immunity. There are so many rumors circling around, but I think we have to be educated ourselves. You make such a great point, and I have so many questions in my head. Um, so here in, in Niagara, it, it, it's gotten somewhat contentious um, where. You know, people have challenged um, some of the things that have come out of public health. Uh, obviously, you know, businesses are frustrated. Some businesses have been closed for a long, long time. Uh, people have been out of work for, like I said, a year. But I can tell you that when we reach out to, to our members, to our businesses, um, and I'll give you the example of the uh, mandatory uh, mask bylaw. So when that was being proposed, um, we were asked to do a quick survey of our membership, and we've got 2,000 members across across South Niagara, to ask them if they would be in support of um, a bylaw uh, for, for, to wear masks. And we all thought, okay, you know, we're, business um, doesn't typically like government <laughs> imposing any rules or any, you know, um, bylaws. But the survey results came back and it was overwhelming support for a mass bylaw. 
And what they were saying, what the businesses were saying were, look, we we are still in business. We still have to have our employees, uh, you know, working. And our number one priority is to make sure that our employees and our customers are safe. And so if there is a bylaw that, that tells people you must wear a mask, that really helps us because then when they come to our, our, our business, you know, that, that's already something in their mind. They're wearing their mask and we feel a little safer. And so I don't think that we're so far apart. Um, you know, public health, certainly their priorities to keep us safe. Businesses, sure, they, they need to be in business, but they want to be safe too. And I think I think what what adds to the frustration is that some of the um, some of the rules, I guess, that come out just don't make any sense. And um, Scott, you'll remember a couple of weeks ago we had um, a couple of our restaurant owners uh, come in, and we were just heading into uh, the red zone, and so restaurants would now be allowed to have ten people in their restaurant. So it doesn't matter if you're a 1,500 square foot restaurant or a 50,000 square foot restaurant, you're allowed 10 people. That makes absolutely no sense. Um, you know, if, Jeff, you're the accountant, what's 10% of 15? $1.5. What's 10% of 50,000? Uh, that would be uh, 5,000. 5,000, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, could, couldn't we uh, do something where it's, it's a percentage of your space? I mean, it still has to be safe. There's lots of space. You have your barriers, you're cleaning, you're doing all that. But it allows these businesses to, to survive. It, it just, I, I don't know if you can respond to that <laughs> at all. It just seems like there's a disconnect sometimes. Are you asking Jeff or me? I'm asking you, <laughs> and then no, we'll go to I, Jeff. No, I think I, I would be happy to respond to this question. You know, so I completely agree. I understand the frustration that business community have, and um, you know, we we agree that there are some you know emerging problems and concerns, and we should not look at everybody at one you know with the one pair of glasses. Definitely, we 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 don't need a cookie cutter approaches. What we really need is customized approaches, customized solutions for people, those who have bigger business, smaller business, you know, bigger space, smaller space. So it is true. But I think, you know, um, policy making takes some time. You know, policy makers are not robotics. You know, they learn from their mistakes too, right? And as you said, this is something new we are experiencing. And, um, you know, we, we make mistakes. And, and I, I think it, it's okay to say, you know, publicly that there are flaws in the system, there are flaws in the policy, but definitely those could be corrected with, with the passage of time. You know, I often say one example, uh, when I teach students say, you know, we are living in a learning health system. And when we say learning healthcare system, it really means that we learn from our mistakes, we learn from what people are saying, we, we open our ears and then see what people are really saying. So, I hear you what you're saying, and I think there has to be some sort of a consideration as to allow some businesses to operate at a, you know, maybe more capacity if they could. But again, that process needs to be streamlined. It has to be systematically looked at, looked into because, um, you know, there could be so many loopholes in the policy if they do that, right? So, so I think you know we have to learn from our mistakes and and then see how it goes. Yeah, and you know, hindsight is is twenty twenty, and I'm sure that when this is all over, there's going to be a lot of blame to go around <laughs> for what you know exactly. for what we didn't do. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, Jeff. Um, so I wanted you to respond to that as well, and and also touch on uh, how important have the government subsidies and programs been to to some of those to some of the businesses that you've been working with two-part question here. Okay. So the first one, obviously some of the rules that got rolled out just don't make, don't seem to make sense. You know, the casino can have 10 people or whatever the case may be in the tiny boutique restaurant can have 10 people. Um, and, and so the bigger businesses just get hurt size wise. I mean, they, there needs to be the best way to allow people to work and make money and feed their families. Um, and some people have been hurt drastically losing their business, losing their house, uh, and other people are flourishing because their business are, are the benefit of not having travel allowed anymore. So, you know, uh, 
home improvement, anything to do with your backyard, pool companies, um, trailer sales, those ones are people are adapting. The people who continue to work and have disposable income aren't spending it um, to fly places and stay in hotels. Uh, they're doing these other things, which makes the hoteliers and the airlines and everybody else suffer. Uh, the, to the second part of your question, the government support uh, has helped a ton of people. Um, and largely the programs have been really well executed. To some extent, the programs have been misguided and has given out a lot of money to companies that don't necessarily need it. Um, but as I've said, part of that comes in the government's ability to make quick decisions. Um, you set rules in place to try and allow as many people as possible to access the support rather than making it restrictive. Um, and then so in certain cases, companies that are having banner years are still able to access some support. Um, <clears throat> but when you look at the most hard hit, the, the, the most vulnerable part of society, um, you've had the CERB and the CRB and the other benefits to keep them afloat. Uh, and, and you see different articles Either way, but Canadians are storing more cash than they ever have. Um, other parts of the population are, are struggling drastically. So the support's been key to keeping businesses going. Uh, I don't know what the long-term effect is. I don't know what the tally of the debt is. The current government hasn't put out a budget in two years, and the numbers are, are ballooning. Um, so the long-term financial impact to our to our grandchildren, to us, is going to be huge um, at what cost? I mean, to some extent, we need to find ways to allow people to open, even as small as it is, to make a living so the government doesn't have to support them. And how, and how difficult is it? And maybe, maybe Stephanie, you, you get this since you're balancing between two countries. Um, you, know, we, you know, you tune into American news uh, and then you'll hear that this state is open. Or the heck with it. We're, we're letting her go. And, you know, I know that you kind of go, oh, that must be great. And it feels like maybe we're on the turn. And, you know, we see the vaccines are coming and all of that. Um, but that's frustrating because it feels like well, we're, we don't see any evidence of that. And so to start with you, Stephanie, like you must hear it from both sides now because, uh, you know, that's that's what you deal in. Absolutely. No, we're living it. Um, I work in the U.S., live in Canada. Um, so absolutely you see it from both sides. And I, I don't proclaim to be an econ you know a specialist in economics and you know obviously this is truly water water cooler talk as the podcast suggests for me anyways you know SF is probably a little bit more versed in it but I think for for us you know we're navigating such a difficult time and I think you know I want to believe that we can protect life and business and livelihoods right I want to believe you can do both but you know the reality the gravity of the situation is that when we have such a major life impacting event like COVID um, and it happens, we have a uh, lack of time and lack of information is not on our side, right? As a leader, there's so many things that go through your head those first few weeks, those first few months, and so many decisions have to be made so fast. You know, for me at the commission, you know, first and foremost was our employees are and their well-being. And then you want to do everything you can do to protect them and ensure their stability. But that that protection, that stability, that comes at a cost to businesses, right? And so as more information becomes available and as we are able to refine our reaction, you know, potentially we're able to mitigate some of those financial impacts, you know, without compromising the employees. But um, the government and public health aren't really all that different, right? I mean, they're still going the same through the same thing. They, I think everybody in government and public health would agree that, you know, one life's too many, one business is too many. I think everybody would say that, but initially without time or information on your side, you know, loss of life's inevitable. And I think we've seen that. And I think we've seen the United States and, and even within the United States, all different states, um, setting policy different, right, based on on what they prioritize. And I think we've seen it in Canada. And I think that the more scientific information that becomes available, um, the we can start to adjust a little bit. 
and we can start to look at what we can do to change those measures. But, at, you know, first, the, the government's just rolling out policy to protect lives. That's the first and foremost, right? And then they have to start figuring out how to dial that back. And that's why you see all these policies changing and the wishy-washiness and, and the lack of answers. It's, it's really not, it's because as leaders, you're trying to make the best decisions with the information you have in such a short amount of time. Um, so in my personal, like my personal opinion, I'm not sure the trade-offs had to last as long as they have in, in, and that's really very much my own personal opinion. I feel like, um, we could probably be doing more to refine our reaction to the initial kind of shock that we went through. And, and kind of like as if said, I think there is, there is opportunity now to maybe customize the plan a lot more. I mean, you know, we're looking a year later and so many businesses are still suffering, not able to open in a meaningful way. And like you said, right across the border, um, it's completely different. I mean, just in New York State, they just announced um, anybody with a vaccine um, really no longer has to follow a lot of the quarantine measures anymore and kind of are free to live their life. And and, it, and it's like it's so polar opposite every day when I go between the two sides. And in New York is actually still very similar to us, believe it or not, throughout this whole thing. I know, I know that's not necessarily what was portrayed in the Canadian media, but really, um, I was over there every day. Um, and, and in it, New York was very similar, but there were a lot of other states that had very different views and different policies, right? So I don't know, from a border perspective, do I think that people can cross the border safely? Do I think we can protect business and people? Yeah, I think we are doing it every day. Essential people and trucks are are crossing every day. Um, but I think uh, you have to be willing to follow some guidelines. I think you know, you're probably going to have to sacrifice some personal rights, some privacy um, for the sake of the common good. And I think some of us are going to be willing to do that. But I think, um, like we talked about, some people aren't. And I think you're going to have those people that consider that are the risk minimizers, you know, that are that are really focused on policy and making sure that um, every life and every aspect of life can be protected. And then you're going to have the recovery supporters, the people that want to have that balance. And there's some that just want it open for their own personal reasons, right? And so I think we're all different. And, and that's what makes us great. But as a leader, it really makes it tough to get it right <laughs> because what's right for one is not going to be right for another person. And so for us, you're right. I see it. I've seen it on both sides and it is so different and, and the views are so different and, but it's different among people too, not just uh, between countries. Each person I work with has a different view. Each employee I work with has a different view. Um, so it's, it's definitely interesting. It, you know, on the U S side, I have, probably close to 60 70 percent of my employees have had their first if not second vaccine and on the canadian side i don't have a, i don't think i have any employees that have it yet so definitely a different a different between the two countries for sure yeah yeah uh, sure. if, i wonder if i can ask you a question do you have any data on the health impact um with, we always talk about with depression um drug use alcoholism even with diabetes and weight gain, with the COVID-15, everybody sitting at home eating bonbons all day, um, surgeries that were pushed off. You know, I, I believe the stat in Niagara was 500 or 400 deaths in the last year. And, and the government does tend to say one life lost is too many, um, which is completely impractical approach to anything, in my opinion. Unfortunately, Stephanie kind of touched on it a little more sensitively than I did, or I will. Um, <laughs> But people are going to die one way or another in a lot of the, the lives lost were elderly people, which are unfortunate to go early. But how many other lives do you put at risk of all these other issues um, by shutting us all down? Yeah, I think, uh, Jeff, you're really highlighting an important issue here. Well, the data is available for sure. And data is continuously being collected for sure. You know, we see... Um, these things in the news most often we look at the articles you know coming from social sectors saying that how much homelessness has increased you know how much this affects on surgeries being rescheduled what is the uh, you know toll of uh, morbidities and mortalities you know if you were to delay that many surgeries so so absolutely there's you know ton of data available but i think what really we need to uh, understand here that how this data translate into our action that's exactly what is more important right um, and I was 
you know, thinking about when uh, Stephanie was talking about vaccinations in U.S. and, you know, saying that, you know, people now are allowed to go open without mask and this and that. Well, I personally think, you know, um, we have to incentivize for the good behavior, right? If somebody is coming forward for vaccination, we have to provide them an sort of incentive to increase or do a positive reinforcement so that people understand, if, okay, if I'm vaccinated, what are the perks I'm getting? Am I allowed to travel? If I'm allowed to go openly in the public and things like that. So I think we have to drive our decision based on the data which is being collected and we have to provide people incentive, you know, so that they can sustain the new behavior. So I think that's important. Um, but again, if you allow me to elaborate more on this uh, point, you know, uh, what should be done now? You know, what should we be doing right now? I think um, in order to lift the lockdown, the standard benchmark is, you know, set by the public health showing that if we have a sustained period of zero new cases, we can completely lift down, you know, the um, lockdown, what we have right now. But the question is, can we have a sustained period of new zero cases? I really doubt about it. So uh, again, uh, speaking of the data, uh, you know, there are epidemiological data, there are data coming from economics. And I think we should be looking into both epidemiology and economics at the same time. So when we talk about epidemiological factors, there are two really key important areas, you know, I often think. One is the susceptible population. So these are people who have not been exposed to disease yet, right? And on the other side, we have infected people, those who have contracted the disease. So the new infection when this arises basically comes, you know, to susceptible people when they interact with the infected people in working and non-working situations. For example, right now we see this UK variant, which is 117, right? That has a reproduction power of 1.9. What does it really mean? It really means that 10 people who are infected with this new variant could potentially pass on this virus to 19 more people. And this is concerning, Jeff. I mean, this is an important piece of information that has to be in, you know, communicated to wider society in business communities and local communities. So we have to really find ways so that we can break the chain of transmission. And how do we do that? Stephanie said vaccination is, is great. And I think vaccination is really a game changer. This is going to provide us some sort of a cushion that, that, you know, that has a, you know, some impact on the economy for sure. Um, vaccine also reduces hospitalization, death rates, the rates of transmission, definitely. But again, you know, she also alluded to the point that, you know, uh, she doesn't have any employees. Uh, those who come from Canada, they're not vaccinated yet. So if we are lagging behind in vaccination, what should we be doing really? I think if we are still waiting for the vaccination, there's still so much we can do. And I call it like a smart containment strategy. So could we do a strict containment strategy or a smart containment strategy? I think smart containment strategy would be where you would allow people to socially interact but at the same time, if those people are found disease positive, they have to quarantine themselves. That's exactly what you know the smart containment refers to. But at the same time, I think people also need to realize this is a new normal, right? We have to think about hygiene practices, you know, washing hands and wearing protective, you know, mask, all that stuff. Uh, so this is important in order to control the epidemiological factors. I call it, you know, the transmission of disease. But if you ask me on the economic side, because I teach health economics to students at Brock University, there are two very uh, basic concepts of economics called supply and demand. And, uh, you know, perhaps one, uh, you know, thing that came up from our discussion this morning about supply, right? So we clearly see there's a shortage of labor supply, which is an important factor driving the, you know, economy on the lower side. But on the other side, we have consumers, we have people. Uh, and we, we, we know that, you know, fear among people is resulting in the reduced consumption of goods and services. And altogether, this is probably leading us to a recession or maybe a kind of a second recession. So, uh, again, uh, could we do something to fix supply and demand issues? Abs absolutely, we can. So what could be done at the organizational level? I think at the organizational level, what we really see now is the emergence of online platform for conducting commerce and education and work and everything, right? which is excellent. You know, um, th there was online shopping before, but now the trend has just gone up, right? There are new jobs being introduced in the online, you know, courier shipping industry and e-commerce. Uh, what could be done at the individual level? Uh, I think people should really be thinking about doing some, uh, you know, new courses. They could upgrade their skills and knowledge, uh, change or navigate new job market. Uh, 
you know, recently again in, in Ontario, the government has introduced a kind of a free uh, online training program for people, those who really want to be a personal support worker. This is amazing, I think, you know, uh, I haven't seen, you know, in the past things like that. So, you know, alternatively, you were going to pay for this course. Now this is going to be free of cost. So at the organizational and individual level, I think people should really be thinking about navigating new job markets. Um, two more things uh, I think which are very important for me to highlight here. One is the taking care of migrant workers. You know, we have lots of migrant workers here in Niagara region and in, in Ontario overall in Canada. So we should be thinking about more frequent testing and corrective measures so that we, we, we you know, provide some sort of, uh, you know, tailor-made services for this vulnerable population. And lastly, you know, travel and tourism. Uh, Stephanie was talking about, you know, the throughfare of traffic between U.S. And, and Canada. I think this is very important. I'm sure nowadays you may have heard about vaccine passport in the news, uh, which is very uh, much emerging uh, concept right now. And I think there are some ethical concerns for vaccination passport, which is okay. But this could be a very good sign to encourage people, those who really want to travel so that they can have vaccination and they can carry vaccination passport. Um, one more thing about tourism is that these, you know, these industries should, should really tell people that we are doing you know, some practices you know, in terms of training and monitoring so that people really feel safe when they come to this hotel or they go for visit of different places. So overall, I think, you know, we have to look into both sides of the equation, the epidemiological side, as well as the economic side. And obviously coming back to you, Jeff, data is available. And I alluded to some of the data in my, you know, just brief talk as well. You think a vaccination passport will cause a further outbreak. So in New York, if these people now have the restrictions um, lifted because they have the vaccination and in Canada, we desperately, m many of us want the vaccination so we can do things. Um, is there gonna be a point of frustration to say, well, forget it. If they're going to hotels, I'm going to hotel too. And you know, it's the Canadian government's fault, not my fault. So I'm just living my life. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, and that's what exactly people are thinking and debating right now. It's a contentious topic for sure. But in the long run, I think we can find a better way to encourage people to go and get immunized. Well, vaccine, and vaccine passport is just like one way of positive reinforcement, right? As I said, we have to incentivize a good behavior. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I know from, uh, again, from the business perspective, um, early on, um, everybody was kind of shell-shocked. And so businesses um, didn't really... Um, um, try and transform to something different. So we, we had a number of businesses who didn't have a digital platform, who weren't, you know, doing anything online. Um, some didn't even have a website. And in those early months, it was really hard to get them um, to look at doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, once we got into the spring and summer, we certainly were trying to in encourage our, our businesses to start moving in that direction. We had a number of, of information sessions. We even had a partnership with Brock University to get students in to, to start implementing some of these things. Um, so many did, did make the, the, the trans, transition, but others didn't. And uh, I don't know, uh, Jeff, I'll pick your brain a little bit. I, I think that those companies um, that haven't tapped into any you know, um, innovation or looked at what their business is going to be moving forward. Once the subsidies are done, once it's time to pay back the, the loans, I think those businesses are going to be in big trouble. What yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen it for the large part a recession, in my opinion, around here, the stock market's booming. We've seen more of a transfer of wealth than, um, overall. So the online companies, those people are picking up more sales. People are buying the same amount of whatever product, but they're not getting it from here anymore. They're going to get it from the online retailer. So the government's keeping a lot of businesses running right now uh, that if they can't make a fundamental shift, won't be in business anymore. In you know, in the history of the world, this has happened often. Polaroid is a company or uh, Kodak, I guess, as a company. Um, was one of the biggest in the world and currently doesn't exist. So they run with these cycles, but people need to be proactive in figuring out, you know, where do they need to be next year 
rather than sitting back and waiting for their business to return to the way it was. Um, how are people going to consume my product or my service going forward? And how, how do I get to offer that? Or what skill sets do I need to develop and go get the training um, for just general employees? Yeah. And it'll be interesting too, to that point, Jeff, when we come out of this, and there was a report on the CBC I saw this morning that said when we come out of this, now it's not, and not that it'll happen overnight, uh, that there's analysts are suggesting that it might be another roaring 20s where it will go from zero to 150. And who's going to be ready for that? When everybody's laid off, there's no employees, and all of a sudden we're going to wake up one day and Stephanie's Bridge is going to be out of control and uh, there's going to be people everywhere and concerts and, and restaurants are going to be lined up outside and, and that's going to be a whirlwind. Yeah, we've looked at it. Oh, sorry. Uh, we've looked at it from two different perspectives too, even at the bridge. I mean, we've thought about it as, you know, are, is everybody at the end of this going to be so anxious to travel that we're going to be busier than maybe we might have otherwise been. But then we've also looked at it from the other perspective, um, from a human nature, human pattern type perspective. You know, I'm now sourcing a lot of my stuff on the Canadian side. And I'm not, and for a year now, I haven't gone to the U.S. to do my shopping. And I've found other ways to source the stuff that I might have otherwise gotten in the U.S. And so, um, you know, do I now go back to the U.S. or does that pattern take a lot longer to reestablish than we think it might otherwise take? You know, people have gotten cottages, purchased cottages. So maybe there's not a need to cross the border as much. Um, so we've kind of looked at it from both perspectives. And to be honest, I'm not sure where it's going to land. I, I really don't know where it's going to land. I think it might be a little bit of both. And But it's definitely an interesting dynamic that we've seen. I mean, just personally, I, I've ordered my groceries online and have them delivered to my house. Do I, I've established that pattern. I've been doing it for a year. Do I really ever set foot back in a grocery store unless I really need to? I don't know. Probably not. I mean, I, you know, I think that humans are, are kind of, you know, habit creatures of habit. And when you for so long for a year change those habits how long does it take for us to reestablish those patterns and connections i know that's you know not something i've obviously analyzed but it's something we think about from a bridge perspective so i think that's right on i think some people are going to just be antsy to go anywhere uh, mm -hmm. and other people are are used to their new pattern and are going to be leery of doing anything um it's going to be interesting mm. yeah for sure I I agree. I agree. I, um, there's an article that um, uh, the World Health Organization put out uh, back in 2020, end of 2020. And um, it, it said that um, in this article, millions of enterprises are facing an existential threat. Nearly half of the world's 3.3 billion global workforce are at risk of losing their livelihoods. That's, that's a huge number. So I'm, I'm wondering, moving forward, um, um, asked if, do you, do you see public health being more aligned with business so that in the event of a health crisis, we can, we can quickly implement strategies that allows businesses and the economy to keep going without jeopardizing lives? I, I mean, we, we couldn't have predicted this, but we, we better have learned something from this. <laughs> No, I agree. Absolutely. And that's exactly what I was saying, learning healthcare systems. So we have learned and we are still learning, right? So obviously there is, uh, you know, some important data available that could be you know, used to form more decisions in the future. Um, so what should we be doing in the next, uh, if this happens again, or we see a similar threat, uh, I think, you know, uh, we have to closely monitor the situation and we be very responsive. You know, we have to come up with more responsive actions. You know, when uh, when we see areas improving and some areas not improving, some business communities improving, some business communities not improving. So we have to, you know, come up with, as I said, the customized approach to addressing those problems. I think more than that, what really important from a public health perspective is that we keep our entire population tested frequently. You know, that's very important because we we want to find out people, those who are infected and trying to create some sort of a distance between infected and susceptible population, you know, until we find a possible, a good possible way to come out from this COVID-19. 
there was there's one more thing you know i really want to highlight here is the differentiation between price and value and i'm sure jeff could also allude to it many at times you know when we look at reports coming from who or even from our local uh, government partners in ontario or canada many times they talk about you know the monetary value like monetary price of the you know things like services how much they have invested into this how much they have invested into program b or program c you know but they really fail to show the value so if you invest let's say you know billions of dollars in vaccination what is the impact that you see do you do you know that impact you know definitely we we now see more results are coming but again rapid testing of covid-19 vaccination you know canada spent you know again billions in the rapid vaccine sorry rapid, rapid testing of covid-19 but again what is the value we drive from that investment so as a healthcare economist and you know as a public health scientist i think we have to tell the community about the value of this intervention rather than just the price of the intervention or investment so again you know uh, we have to balance both the economic side of it as well as the livelihood but again it's going to be hard we are learning from this experience we will make more mistakes in the future and i am very adamant about it and that's that's nothing wrong with making mistakes it's it's a learning process but i think we are emerging as a resilient society our system is learning a lot and making some examples for the future oh wow. So Can I? Uh, oh, yeah. I go ahead. Ask, I want to okay. ask one more question here because I'm a longtime listener of this series and you know first time caller here, and nobody ever grills Scott with it with a good question. Since you're involved in media, do you think that this public health crisis is is perpetuating the lack of trust in media? Also, I mean, lack of trust in government, um, kind of a lack of trust in each other. If we go back to the, the Netflix show, The Social Dilemma. There's just a lot of bickering online every time anything goes up by any news source that these stats are either BS or anyway, what's your opinion on the long term negative impact to the media industry? Well, I mean, you know, we, 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 we did a recent podcast on on uh, on media and, it, and its effects. And to that point, I think the media has probably not done the best job ever. I think they do what they think is right. But at the end of the day, I've always sort of felt that it comes back to that mentality. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about social media. I'm talking about media as, you know, the, the ones we, we, the six o'clock news kind of scenario or radio, right? Um, the whole bleeds and leads kind of world still continues to exist in media. And some medias have stopped um, reporting as constantly the numbers because of the negative, you know, even though at first that negativity sells, it was becoming too much. So let's try to focus a little more on the resolved cases. And I mean, that argument's been out there since the beginning, right? All we hear is, you know, those who didn't, didn't make it or those who, who have, you know, gotten COVID-19, but we don't talk about how many got through it or how many are out of hospital or whatever. So from that perspective, yes. And there's always been a lack of good news, I think. Uh, one other thing that I know a lot of uh, media outlets have done, which have changed, and it's probably a learning uh, type of thing is that for a while when it first started with the variants, it was the UK variant and the South African variant. And a lot of media outlets have changed and said the variant first discovered in because of that whole negative connotation. We were suddenly saying that it was this country's fault and that country's fault, which is not. I mean, we don't know where it came from. We just know that that's where it was discovered first. Um, and as a result of COVID too, Jeff, I don't know if this is answering your question, but this is just my thoughts on it is a lot of other news stories have just fallen by the wayside because all we talk about is either the U.S. election or COVID. Uh, and that may, even no matter who's in power, that's still all we talk about uh, uh, far too often. I mean, certainly local media tries to focus in on what they can, but um, the pandemic has overtaken much of that media as well. So I think, you know, media outlets are always questioned about, are they doing it responsibly or are they doing it well? You know, they're under a lot of pressures. We're under pressures as well to have because our revenues, media revenues, I can't speak for, for anybody other than ourselves, but, you know, I have a lot of friends who work in it and the revenues have just devastated media because nobody's advertised in, in an on and on goes. So, um, so, yeah, it's a matter of finding the right tales to tell. But I, I would agree that COVID has 
probably overtaken the media reporting to a point where people don't trust those numbers. As uh, Asim said earlier, how accurate are they anyway? Because, you know, depending on when they're reported and who's getting tested and how many. And, you know, when we saw that in Ontario with the Toronto numbers, because it would just skew everything, right? And all of a sudden, it was just like, well, what's real? And, um, and I think that is why a lot of people don't believe anything they hear. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Oh, no, now wear three masks, you know? And, uh, and we just keep putting it out there because that's the information we're fed. And uh, is that a lack of due diligence? Well, I think nobody really knows the answer. So um, I think that's why a lot of people take those days where they go, I'm off the news for a few days because I need the mental break. Whether it's right or wrong, I have no idea, but I can't stress out over it anymore. So I don't know if that, that's my, that's my first question and my, my, my first answer. I hope that, is that, is that good? Absolutely. Okay. You could be a panelist every week. All right. <laughs> awesome. I think there's one, there's one more thing, uh, Scott, uh, you know, you talked about some of the challenges media is facing, but I think it's extremely important for being a public health scholar, you know, for me to say that social media is something we really find very concerning, to be very honest. You know, I have students, they have found videos on WhatsApp, on YouTube, on TikTok, you know, some of them are not really, you know, based on scientific information. So how do we address those issues in social media, which are somehow, you know, uh, changing the mindset of local community member. This is a big concern for public health too, so. Yeah, yeah. we talked yeah. about that a little bit, Scott, last week. You, you yeah. can elaborate. <laughs> well, I mean, social media is, it's, it's, I guess it's come to the point where it's a necessary evil, right? I mean, even the major news outlets, uh, a lot of their traffic is driven by social media, but Everyone is a journalist now. Everyone has an iPhone. Everyone has an opinion, uh, which is which is great. But the question becomes: Does society differentiate between, uh, you know? And I think that's that's why there's such a left and right component to to the population, especially in the South now, is because you know what you want to hear, and the Google algorithm is going to send you what you want to hear anyway. So you never go past that. So if you're a CNN viewer, then this is the way I see the world. And if I'm a Fox viewer, this is the way I see the world and never the two shall pass. And that's an unfortunate situation. I'm thankful we're not there yet, at least in this country. Yeah, very well said. Okay. Uh, I think, Dolores, we're probably, we're getting close to the, uh, to the end now. Uh, and this has been a great, great conversation. And, and uh, how do you ever... Uh, make both sides happy, the economy and, and, and the, uh, you know, the public health scenario. So uh, Stephanie, uh, Jeff, and Asif, thanks so much for uh, your, your conversation and your input to this. Uh, this was great. Fantastic. Well, Scott, next week, we're going to have another great conversation. Uh, we'll be talking about modern day democracy and the impact it has on our lives as citizens. Um, I'm really excited about our panel. We're going to be joined by Dave Meslin. He's the author of Tear Down, Rebuilding Democracy from the Ground Up. Janet Ecker, former member of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. And Dave Augustine, former mayor of uh, the town of Pelham. So we're looking forward to that, that conversation next week. To all of our listeners, send us the topics that you're talking about because we want to talk about them too. Thanks again for tuning in and have yourselves a great day. <laughs>